Good evening, everyone. I'm Richard Moses, president of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative, also known as LESPI. Very happy to welcome you to our book talk tonight, Rebel Cinderella, From Rags to Riches to Radical, The Epic Journey of Rose Pastor Stokes, with the author Adam Hochschild. For those of you who aren't familiar with LESPI, we're a not-for-profit group formed in 2007, whose mission is the preservation of the historic Lower East Side which includes the East Village, Lower East Side below Houston Street, Chinatown, Little Italy, and the Bowery. We do this through education, outreach, and advocacy, primarily for New York City Landmarks Commission designated historic districts and individual landmarks. Along with preserving the area's beautiful historic architecture, we also push to help maintain the traditional culture and diversity of the Lower East Side one of the most important historic areas of the country due to its immigration, political, and artistic history. About our co-sponsors, Village Preservation has been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. Their public programming is meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history, and depth, and the value of preservation in our communities. Victorian Society of New York is the oldest chapter of the Victorian Society in America, founded in 1966. The New, <coughs> excuse me, the New York chapter fosters appreciation and preservation of myriad aspects of 19th and early 20th century heritage with lectures, tours, performances, preservation advocacy, community outreach, and grants. Now, during the lecture, Please put any questions you may have in the Q&A section, which should, should be at the bottom of your screen. We'll now do a quick poll asking where everybody lives. Don't worry, the answers are anonymous. Okay, great. So uh, it looks like about 30% of you uh, live uh, in the Lower East Side including the East Village, Chinatown, Little Italy, uh, and uh, Lower East Side below Houston and Chinatown. Uh, about a little over 50% live in New York uh, City outside the Lower East Side. Uh, a little over 10% in the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And uh, about 6% uh, in the US outside the tri-state area. And we have no uh, international visitors uh, today. So thank you all uh, for participating in our poll, it's always nice for us to see uh, where you're all coming from. So I'm now happy uh, to introduce my fellow Lesby board member, Deborah Wai, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Hello, um, I'm very pleased that Adam Hochschild is with us tonight to talk about his latest book, Rebel Cinderella, From Rags to Riches to Radical, The Epic Journey of Rose Pastor Stokes. This riveting biography follows in a long line of this author's award-winning books, which delve into, the, into history from a human rights and social justice perspective. Adam, Hochschild, Adam Hochschild began his career as a journalist in Berkeley, California in the 1960s, writing about such topics as the civil rights and anti-Vietnam War movements. In the 70s, he was co-founder of the magazine Mother Jones, and is still associated with that publication. Many celebrated books followed, exploring such, such subjects as apartheid in South Africa, Stalin's Russia, the Spanish Civil War, and the Belgian Congo, among others. In his work, Hochschild always searches out the stories of individuals, those who make history come alive. His biography of Rose Pastor Stokes is one such very personal tale that also illuminates a tumultuous period in American history, and more specifically, shines a light on the role of downtown New York within the social and political currents of that time, on the Lower East Side and also in the West Village, where this remarkable woman lived for a time. I should add that our author was born in New York City, and although he grew up elsewhere and has lived in Berkeley for many years, he says that he still considers New York the center of the world. I first became acquainted with Rose Pastor Stokes through a fictionalized account of her life, written by the Lower East Side author Anzia Yazirska, 
in her 1923 novel, Salome of the Tenements. When Rebel Cinderella came out, I couldn't wait to read it and learn more about this fascinating woman. We are all very much looking forward to tonight's presentation. So welcome, Adam. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Richard. And it's a pleasure uh, talking to a group of people who, like me, care a great deal about the history of New York. As Deborah said, uh, I happen to be a Californian at the moment, but in my heart, I'm still a New Yorker where I was born, and I come back to the city often and uh, still do feel that it's the center of the world. So I'm going to tell you about this book through a slideshow for which I need to share my screen. And let me know if that's working. You should be seeing the um, cover of the book on the screen now. Um, and um, most of the book is about this woman, Rose Pastor Stokes, a really remarkable, but uh, today largely forgotten figure. But it's also about her very unusual marriage and one which is a window, I hope, onto life in this country a little more than a century ago. Its hopes, its illusions, and its enormous injustices. Let me trace her story first. The woman who became Rose Pastor Stokes was born in Tsarist Russia in the town of Augustov. Today, it's in the far northeast corner of Poland, which of course didn't exist as a country back then. Uh, born there in 1879. Now, she was Jewish, but the Jews of Augustov, or at least some of them, did not live in a separate shtetl because Rose's father, from whom her mother separated very soon after her birth, uh, who was a cobbler, lived above his shop on this central square of the town. When Rose was born, the Russian Empire was then under the rule of Tsar Alexander II. And you may recall that he was the reformer Tsar, the Tsar who freed the serfs. And he also eased a few of the severe restrictions on Russia's Jews. He was by no means an enthusiast for human rights, but he was considerably less anti-Semitic than many others in the Romanov dynasty. However, the lives of Rose and her family and millions of other people were upended by an event that happened two years after her birth, hundreds of miles away in St. Petersburg, the empire's capital. Tsar Alexander II was assassinated. And as soon as he was dead, his successor imposed harsh new restrictions on Russia's Jews. And over the next 25 years, there were a series of pogroms. Hundreds of people were killed. Often Jewish homes and shops were burned, leaving their owners homeless. And this, of course, was what spurred the great exodus of millions of Jews out of the Russian Empire. Among them was Rose, then three years old, and her divorced mother. They went first to England and stayed for seven years in London, living in great poverty in the city's East End. And while there, from age three to 11, Rose had the only formal schooling she ever had, less than two years. But it was enough for her to gain the ability to read and write in English, they spoke Yiddish at home, and to discover she had a great love for English poetry. When she was 11, in 1890, she and her mother came to the United States, like so many millions of other immigrants, on a packed ship that looked like this one. And they went to Cleveland, Ohio. As soon as they got there, Rose immediately had to go to work in a factory making cigars. There was no time for school now. She never went back to school again in her life. And she labored in this factory for the next dozen years. Uh, this is the first photograph we know of in which she appears. She's third from the left in the back row. There she is a little bit closer in the center of the back row. She worked in cigar factories for a dozen years. Uh, by the end of that time, she was supporting herself, her mother, and six younger siblings who'd been abandoned by a ne'er-do-well stepfather. 
She worked all day. Often she worked evenings as well in neighborhood smaller um, cigar workshops. For this, she earned roughly $8 a week, equivalent to about $240 today, very little on which to support, clothe, and house a family of that size. And rolling cigars was hard work. The oil in the tobacco seeped into your clothes, your skin. It was impossible to get rid of the smell. The air in these cigar factories had to be kept humid so that the outer wrapper leaves of the cigars uh, wouldn't uh, crack and break. So in summertime, the windows were nailed shut. Uh, and summer and winter both, very fine tobacco dust filled the air and it filled workers' lungs. Uh, cigar workers had the second highest rate of tuberculosis in the United States. Only stone cutters had it worse. And Rose would have lung problems as long as she lived. When she was 21, something happened that would change her life. A neighbor brought the family a copy of a Yiddish newspaper published in New York, the Yiddish's Tageblatt, or Jewish Daily News. And the paper ran one page each issue in English, and it invited contributions from readers around the country. It was basically a New York Daily newspaper that was trying to go national, so it was reaching out to Jewish communities everywhere. It invited readers to send in stories, anecdotes, news of your community, whatever. Rose started to do this, right into the paper, and began sending articles, poems, stories. She was amazed one day to receive a check for $2 in the mail and realized she could actually make money from writing. Fairly soon, the paper gave her an advice column to write called Just Between Ourselves, Girls, which she wrote under the pen name of Zelda. She was even more amazed when after two years, the newspaper invited her to come to New York City to write full-time for its English page at double the salary she was earning as a cigar worker. So at the beginning of 1903, 23 years old, Rose arrived in New York. And imagine how amazing the city looked then to somebody who was seeing it for the first time skyscrapers like none she had ever seen before, elevated trains like this one puffing along above the streets pulled by steam locomotives, trolleys on the streets below pulled by cables underneath the streets, uh, and below that an enormous subway network just being built but not open yet, and even on the streets you could see a few of the extraordinary new horseless carriages. Now, New York at that time is a city that would have terrified Donald Trump because it was a city of immigrants. More than half the men in Manhattan over 20 years old were foreign born. And New York would soon be the largest city in the world. It was already the largest Jewish city on it. And the heart of that city, of course, was the Lower East Side, where Rose lived and worked. Uh, the people that she did feature stories for the newspaper about were folks like these peddlers or people who worked in the butcher shop you can see behind them. Uh, she roamed the neighborhood talking to people, writing about their stories. But one day in the summer of 1903, the newspaper editor gave her a different assignment, which was to go and interview someone who worked at a settlement house. At a settlement house. Now, you know, I'm sure, something about settlement houses. These were set up to provide services to poor neighborhoods throughout the big cities of the Northeast. They did things like having childhood nutrition programs, uh, providing baths and showers, not just for kids, but for adults, because tenements like those that filled New York City at that time often didn't have baths and showers. Uh, they provided adult education classes in English literacy and other subjects. Now, the interesting thing about settlement houses is that they served a population that was almost entirely immigrant and poor, but the volunteers who staffed them tended to be well-to-do college graduates. 
This is the settlement house on the Lower East Side where Rose was sent to do her interview, the university settlement, uh, still there in the same building today at the corner of Eldridge and Rivington Streets. And this is the guy that she was sent to interview, a volunteer who was working there and who was living in the settlement house as well. James Graham Phelps Stokes, called Graham by his friends. And as you can tell from the name, he was Anglo-Saxon Protestant. He and Rose fell in love. Now, Graham Stokes came from the most different kind of background from Rose's imaginable. Here, for example, is his family's summer home. When it was built, in the 1890s in the Berkshire Mountains in Western Massachusetts, it was the largest private home in the United States, 100 rooms. Legend has it that a brother of Graham's, who was in the class of 1896 at Yale, sent a telegram to his mother saying, bringing some apostrophe 96 fellows home for the weekend. The apostrophe got dropped from the telegram and his mother replied to him, many guests already here have only room for 50. Here's the view from the front porch of the house which overlooked a lake. Uh, and another legend has it that when Graham's father was once entertaining a guest, a man looked out through one of these stone arches and said that the arch framed the view very nicely but if only there were a snow-capped mountain out there in the center of the view, and Graham's father supposedly replied, for heaven's sakes, don't say that to my wife, she'll order one tomorrow. Now, if you were writing a novel, somebody who lives in a house like this falls in love with a poor immigrant sweatshop worker who had worked uh, most of her, almost all her working life in cigar factories, nobody would believe it, but it happened. When not at one of several country places like that that they have, the family lived in New York uh, on Madison Avenue in this mansion, Madison 37th Street, the fashionable Murray Hill neighborhood. Today, the building is part of the Morgan Library. These are Graham Stokes's parents. Uh, each of them came from large fortunes, which they combined. Uh, the money came in part from the Phelps Dodge mining empire, uh, some of it from New York City real estate, especially luxury apartment buildings on the Upper East Side, some of it from a cluster of gold and silver mines in Nevada and a railroad that led, led to them, and other sources as well. Uh, Graham's parents had nine children, and they and some of their spouses and offspring are in this picture. The boys in the family were expected to play prominent roles in life, and they did. Uh, one became a famous architect, uh, actually designed that building at the university settlement. Uh, one became an editorial writer for the New York Times. One became what today would be called provost at Yale University. A grandson became an Episcopal bishop. The girls in the family were expected to marry well, and they did. One married a European nobleman and acquired a title. Uh, incidentally, not the only daughter of a wealthy American family of that era to do so. Uh, another one of the girls married into the family of a former Secretary of State. Graham Stokes, however, took a somewhat different uh, route in life than his siblings. Uh, after graduating from Yale, he went to medical school at Columbia and it was while working on a horse-drawn ambulance as a medical student, an ambulance from Roosevelt Hospital, that he was exposed to a very different New York than the one he'd grown up in. This was the New York of the tenements, and he was shocked by what he saw. Immigrants living packed sometimes six, seven, eight people to a room, some of these older tenements, uh, the only toilets they had were outdoor outhouses like these. And of course, New York tenements of that era were notorious for being not just living spaces, but factories, makeshift sweatshops for the city's garment industry. 
Graham was outraged by what he saw, and that was what led him to become part of the Settlement House movement. After they met in uh, 1903, he and Rose courted secretly for two years, and finally, news of their engagement leaked out. And it received immense attention. Newspapers all across the United States in Europe and Australia reported the story of this remarkable romance. What you're looking at here is a page one headline from the New York Times. Here it is as the lead story on the front page of the New York Evening World. And as you can see, what attracted attention was not just that it was a marriage of someone extremely rich and someone extremely poor, but of Jew and Gentile, which was extraordinarily unusual for the day. So there was both a class and an ethnic difference, exactly what makes people fascinated with similar marriages today. Like, look at all the attention we lavish on that of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. The same newspaper, The Evening World, immediately signed up Rose to write a series of articles calling her the genius of the ghetto. And finally, despite the well-concealed dismay of Graham's family, the couple married on July 18th, 1905, Rose's 26th birthday. Graham was seven years older. The press remained fascinated by this couple for years, and they lived in a blaze of publicity for two decades. And the core of the public's fascination was that here there seemed to be the Cinderella story. Prince Charming had come along and rescued poor virtuous Cinderella from her humble hearth and brought her to live in his castle. And of course, love would conquer all the differences between them. Here's a picture of Rose soon after they married. Uh, they remained on the Lower East Side, living at 47 Norfolk Street, which is three or four blocks from today's Tenement Museum. Uh, but it was not a tenement building. They, they had a five or six room apartment in the building with an elevator. However, their lives did not fit the Cinderella script because Graham Stokes to some degree had left the castle and Rose had no desire to live in one although they often stayed at one of the very grand houses of his parents, it always made her uncomfortable. She and Graham were both acutely <laughs> conscious that they lived in a country with enormous disparities of wealth. Some people lived the way Graham's family did, others were desperately poor, and often worked in dangerous conditions as well, like these child coal miners in West Virginia. In 1906, the year after they married, Rose and Graham joined the group that they thought had the best answer to these problems, to the enormous inequalities in the United States, the Socialist Party. The party's leader at that time and for many years before and after was Eugene V. Debs, a noble, much beloved man, five times the candidate for president, he had uh, begun as leader of the Railway Workers Union. And so railway workers all over the country knew him, admired him. And when he campaigned as socialist candidate for president in 1908, he did so on a special train called the Red Special with red flags flying and the sides draped with red bunting. And engineers of passing locomotives were thrilled when they saw the Red Special coming along the track and greeted him with long whistle blasts. Now, Graham Stokes was on the ballot that year in 1908 as well, and he and Deb spoke from the same platform when the Red Special came to New York, because Graham was running as a socialist candidate for the New York State Assembly from the Lower East Side. Rose went out and campaigned for him, giving speeches in English or Yiddish as the occasion required. Neither Graham nor Debs won, but people still remained fascinated by this couple. And everyone still saw them as the Cinderella story. Their marriage inspired two novels. This is one of them. And this one was turned into a silent film. Um, 
here is one of the promotional photos from the film. Uh, because it was silent, we don't know exactly what the characters are supposed to be saying to each other there. These are the characters modeled on Rose and Graham. Your guess is as good as mine. Now, this was an era when people throughout the United States, despite their Cinderella fantasies, were becoming conscious, even people not living in great poverty, millions of Americans were becoming aware of the enormous inequalities of wealth in this country that were a legacy of the Gilded Age. They were becoming aware of how widespread American injustice was. And one episode that dramatized the terrible labor conditions of this day, which I'm sure you as New Yorkers know a lot about, involved clothing workers. And I'm speaking, of course, of the Triangle Fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Company just off Washington Square. A terrible fire in 1911. Workers were trapped on the upper floors of this building. Most were unable to get out of the clothing workshop there. There was an inadequate fire escape which collapsed from the weight of the people on it. The door to a stairwell, which might have provided an escape route from the fire, was locked to keep out union organizers. 146 people died, either burned to death or they leapt out the window to their deaths to escape the flames. Of the dead, almost all were women, half were teenagers, almost all were immigrants, Jewish and Italian. 120,000 people marched in a morning procession, morning procession through the streets of Manhattan, more than 300,000 people lined those streets to honor them. As Rose continued her journalism, it now became more and more issues of labor and social justice that she was writing about. She also wrote about women's rights and she got involved in one case that had echoes of the same kind of battles still going on in the Me Too era today. The case that drew her attention was that of a woman named Sarah Cooten, who worked as a nurse for a doctor on the Upper East Side whose home and office were in the same building. The doctor gave her a room there in which she lived, and one night he piped chloroform underneath her door, and when she was unconscious, he raped her. Uh, some weeks later, she realized she was pregnant. She went out and bought a gun, shot and killed the doctor, and surrendered to the police. Rose went to the prison where she was being held, interviewed her in Yiddish. Sarah Coton told Rose her story at much greater length than anyone else had. And then Rose announced to the press that she would pay Sarah Coton's legal expenses and once she was released from prison, would give her and the baby a place to stay. The trial was delayed until she gave birth, and she was finally found innocent, in part because another woman, assaulted by the same doctor, came forward with her story. Starting a few years after Rose and Graham married, for a decade or so, the United States was convulsed by strikes with hundreds of thousands of workers walking out each year. And this was at a time when labor unions had almost none of the rights that they later acquired. Strikes were often suppressed by police and sometimes by troops. These are striking clothing workers in Massachusetts facing state militia. One of the biggest strikes was of garment workers in New York City. And if you can read the signs in this slide, you'll see they're in four languages, uh, English, Russian, Yiddish, and Italian. Rose was heavily involved in this strike, uh, speaking to groups of strikers often many times each day. And it was really at this point that she began to come into her own as an organizer and as an immensely popular speaker. She was soon recognized as one of the great radical orators of her time. And she began eclipsing her husband in the attention that the press paid to them. And gradually the ongoing cascade of newspaper stories about them were more about her than about them as a couple. And there are signs that he was not completely happy about this. 
The most colorful strike that Rose got involved in was one of hotel and restaurant workers in New York in 1912. Organizers walked into one restaurant or hotel dining room after another by prearrangement, usually just as lunch or dinner was about to be served, blew a whistle and the waiters walked out. This happened at the Waldorf Astoria, Delmonico's, the Luncheon Club of the New York Stock Exchange, and dozens of lesser restaurants as well. Rose was on the strike committee. She addressed many rallies of the striking waiters. She wrote and spoke about the miserable conditions in which many of them worked. And in her papers, there are many, many letters of thanks from waiters and kitchen workers. Now, one of the hotels whose restaurants were struck was the Ansonia. Uh, in a building which is still there, now it's an apartment house, on Broadway between 73rd and 74th Streets. Uh, the Ansonia had several dining rooms, and these were famous gathering places for musicians, show business people, and mobsters. Now, what made things tricky was that the owner of the Ansonia was Graham Stokes's uncle, William Earl Dodge Stokes, or Uncle Will, as they called him. He was a passionate hater of labor unions, immigrants, and much more. Uh, a big fan of the eugenics movement, in fact. And he was absolutely furious that his beloved nephew's wife was organizing his own workers to go on strike. Uh, he'll later come back into the story, you'll see. Um, let me turn to another aspect of Rose's and Graham's lives. One of the things that made them so fascinating for me to write about was their friends. They knew and worked with what to me are the most interesting people in the United States of that era. And here are some of them. There's Rose with Eugene Debs on the left and uh, standing behind them, Max Eastman, editor of the magazine, The Masses the most interesting magazine in the country at the time, in many ways sort of a precursor to the New Yorker. Rose and Graham also were friends with Big Bill Haywood, the leader of the Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world, the country's most militant labor union. Uh, Haywood was a former miner, cowboy, saloon card dealer, charismatic orator, famous for using his fists when necessary, and for being able to recite long passages of Shakespeare by heart. Also in their circle was John Reed, probably the finest journalist of his generation, as well as Lincoln Steffens, the great muckraker, W.E.B. Du Bois, the greatest black intellectual of his time, Mother Jones, Mary Harris Jones, the great labor organizer. Rose and Graham knew all of these people. They knew Upton Sinclair, the novelist, to whose novel, The Jungle, we owe our pure food and drug laws. As Sinclair was writing that book, he sent it chapter by chapter to Graham Stokes for his comments. They were friends with Margaret Sanger in the center of this picture, the birth control pioneer. We take access to birth control for granted today, but this Brooklyn clinic where this photo was taken was shut down by the police and Sanger went to jail. Rose was active in the campaign for birth control when talking publicly about things was then against the law. They were close uh, friends with Emma Goldman, the anarchist firebrand, shown here in one of the mugshots taken at the time of one of her several arrests. Uh, all of these folks, Rose and Graham knew, they worked with many of them, many of them were their house guests, and some left us their recollections of this remarkable couple. Goldman, for instance, who was always very blunt, thought Graham was a stuffed shirt and couldn't understand how Rose put up with him. So the period of American life when all these people were active was a remarkable time, a time when all of them believed that the world could be changed and that a new and more just society could be brought into being. Sadly, though, something happened that brought that period of great confidence and optimism to an end the First World War. 
The war not only killed millions of soldiers and civilians, it also shattered the longtime radical dream that the working classes of different countries would never fight against each other. The United States, however, did not join the war when it started. American socialists and other radicals uh, agitated strongly for the US to stay out of the war. Rose, Emma Goldman, and many of their friends joined something called the Women's Peace Party. This is a parade they held on the Fifth Avenue. However, in the spring of 1917, after the war had been going nearly three years, President Woodrow Wilson went before Congress and asked it to declare war. And American troops began going to France, soon in large numbers. And by mid-1918, they were heavily involved in some of the most fierce fighting. Here at home, the country was swept by war fever and by ferocious government propaganda like this US Army enlistment poster. There was a tremendous paranoia about spies. Uh, posters and warnings like this appeared everywhere. And that paranoia was directed against anti-war radicals. I don't know if you can read the caption at the top of this cartoon. It says, now for a roundup. And it shows Uncle Sam uh, rounding up various people, the IWW's assorted traitors and so on. Many radicals still felt very strongly that the US entering the war was a huge mistake, but they were harassed or arrested when they spoke out. The war created a rift between Rose and Graham. Rose became firmly convinced that it had been a terrible mistake for the United States to join the war. Graham Stokes, however, was so enthusiastic about the war that he enlisted and went into uniform. He was too old to get sent overseas, although he tried mightily to make that happen. Uh, but for several years, he was in the New York National Guard, although he never came closer to combat than marching in parades like this one going down Fifth Avenue. Something else that divided Rose and Graham happened in late 1917, the second stage of the Russian Revolution when the Bolsheviks seized power. Rose was for this, Graham was against it. Rose continued speaking out against the war and now in favor of the Russian Revolution. And this drew the rage of many people, including Graham's uncle, the angry hotel owner. You remember him. Here's a report about him, Uncle Will, from the Bureau of the Files of the Bureau of Investigation, the predecessor of the FBI, uh, <clears throat> saying that uh, Rose had had meetings with socialists at her house and that if a search was made of the premises, some valuable information could be secured. A few days later, we know from other records, he called the Bureau of Investigation, told them Rose and Graham were out of town and that this would be a good chance to search the house. The Bureau kept a very close eye on Rose. Its agents followed her, government stenographers transcribed her speeches, and after one anti-war talk, she was arrested. This happened in the summer of 1918. She was swiftly put on trial and she was sentenced to 10 years in prison uh, for speaking out against the war. Graham Stokes put up bail money, they appealed the case and eventually it was overturned on appeal. So Rose did not have to go to jail, uh, but she lived under that threat for several years. By this point, however, their marriage was in real trouble. They remained together for seven years more, but very, very uneasily so because they were going radically different directions in politics. Rose joined the new Communist Party. And in 1922, she actually went to Russia as an American delegate to a meeting of the Communist International. Like far too many people, she thought that there she had found paradise. Graham began looking for paradise in a different direction. He abandoned all his involvement in progressive politics and became deeply interested in religion, particularly in blending the traditions of Hinduism and Christianity. 
Finally, in 1925, they got divorced very bitterly. This put them back on front pages for the last time. And as soon as they were no longer a couple, the press completely lost interest in them. But happily for me, they saved all their letters, Rose kept a diary, and they wrote dueling memoirs. So I had rich, rich material to work from and to try to reconstruct their relationship and the ringside seat they had to a remarkable period of American history. So do historians a favor, save your letters. These days that probably means saving your texts and emails too. Uh, keep diaries, write memoirs, create raw material that we can work from. Uh, after their divorce, uh, Graham remarried, but made no leap out of his class this time. He married the daughter of a railroad executive. He lived on to the age of 88, dying in 1960. Uh, when they got divorced, as a matter of principle, Rose refused alimony. She was reduced to poverty again. She remarried, but to someone as poor as she was, she soon came down with cancer, and she died at the age of 53 in 1933. So that's their story. I wish I could say they changed the world. They didn't, but perhaps through their eyes, we can see a world that needed changing and that still does today. I hope you'll enjoy getting to know them as much as I did. So why don't I stop right there? And uh, if you've got uh, questions or comments, uh, I would be glad to hear them. Uh, we do have a few uh, questions, not too many. Um, that was uh, really uh, phenomenal, uh, Adam. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Great. Uh, the um, questions that we have here are, um, somebody asked how many people are attending. It was about 110 mm -hmm. at the height of it um, attending. Uh, somebody asked about uh, Stokes Hall at Haverford College whether that, uh, that name is from the Phelps Stokes family. I don't know if- uh... I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. It could well be, but it's, it's not an uncommon name. Someone asked about uh, the address of their uh, apartment on Norfolk Street and if it's still there. Uh, 47 Norfolk Street. Uh, I have not looked to see whether the building is still there. Uh, they later on lived in a townhouse at uh, 88 Grove Street, and that is still there, although remodeled. Uh, I didn't have time to uh, talk about the most interesting place they lived, which maybe I should say a word about. Uh, when they got married in 1905, Graham's mother, as a wedding present, gave them an island off the coast of Connecticut, uh, just off Stamford, Connecticut, con connected to the mainland by a causeway. And Graham's architect brother built them a house there. And as you can imagine, a, a private island within commuting distance of New York City, uh, I'm sure did not come cheaply then as it would not today. And they lived there for uh, about a dozen years. And that's the place where I would have liked to have uh, been, um, you know, listening in as they had weekend house parties with some of these people that I showed you pictures of, because uh, many of them were their house guests at one time or another at this, this island. Uh, thank you. And um, <clears throat> someone pointed out that tomorrow is the anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist uh, Factory. Huh. So mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. a, a sad, sad occasion. Um, and uh, Someone asked, uh, was Rose friends with Anzia who wrote Salami? Anzia Yezirka, yes, she was. Uh, Anzia Yezirka actually was a, uh, was a guest at their wedding. Uh, and then years later wrote uh, this novel, Salome of the Tenements, which was sort of loosely modeled <coughs> on Rose and Graham. By the time it got made into a film, it was even more loose and, and departed much more from their lives. Unfortunately, neither Rose nor Graham left any record about what they thought about the novel and the film, because it is quite a remarkable, unusual experience to have your life uh, fictionalized. Uh, this is one of the many questions I would have liked to have asked them had I been able to uh, go back in time and interview. Uh, someone asked where Rose is buried. 
you know, we do not know. She died under unusual circumstances, and I'll tell you that. Um, she suffered from breast cancer. It spread, and over the course of three or four years, she went through treatments. Um, radiation treatment for cancer was in its infancy at that time, but she believed that the best radiation treatment was to be had from a doctor in Germany, in Frankfurt, uh, who was well known for doing this kind of thing. Uh, and she made three trips to Germany to receive this special radiation treatment from him, had great faith in this doctor. She did not know that he was actually an ardent member of the Nazi party. Um, he must have known that she was Jewish, but perhaps the appeal of having a well-known person as his, as his patient uh, overcame that because there are very friendly letters from him in English uh, in her mm -hmm. files, and he sent medicine to her in the United States. She died in Germany, and uh, a couple weeks before she died, she wrote a letter to a friend in New York saying, uh, my ashes will be coming back to you before long because I don't have much time left. Um, but there's no record of where those ashes finally ended up. Uh, someone asked about the name of the island in Connecticut. It was originally called Waits Island, W-A-I-T-E apostrophe S. Rose renamed it Caritas Island using the Latin word that is variously translated as care or love or concern for others. And that's what they called it when they lived there. Is it still called that today, do you know? No. Um, you know, I was just talking with Deborah before we began about a film that was made by somebody who lived on the island years later. And it was called something else then, but I cannot remember. I think its name has changed with each owner. Mm -hmm. Somebody lives there now, but I don't know who. And. Uh, there's a question about how did you decide to do this uh, story, this history? Well, um, I love to do history that is centered on people because I believe that the best way to get readers to pay attention to a, a period of time that I'm interested in or a phenomenon or an event or something I'm interested in is to tell the story of somebody who lived through it. And I was also fascinated because this marriage seemed so unusual and because the richness of the documentary letter, record, you know, these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters, Rose's diary, the memoirs each of them wrote, uh, provided a chance to sort of look inside the marriage of, of other people far in the past in a way that you usually don't get. Uh, I first became aware of her when years ago, I was writing a book about uh, how Russians today are coming to terms with Stalinism. And I, I lived in Russia for a time. And then I did a lot of research here on the early days of the Soviet Union. And at one point I came across a photograph of the American delegates to the 1922 meeting of the Communist International in Moscow that I briefly alluded to a slideshow. And here was this woman with this uh, quite uh, Jewish looking face and this extremely wasp New York high society name sitting in the front row. And I wondered what was her story? And I was so struck by this, I made a copy of the photo and filed it away, but then I got distracted doing other books. And then um, a few years ago, when I was looking around for a topic for my next book, uh, I started reading a lot of American history of the progressive era, you know, the decade before World War I. And I realized, as uh, is often the case in people I write about, I was not the first person to be fascinated by <clears throat> this person. There are others who've written about her, uh, but she's forgotten today. And I just thought it would be fascinating to try to dive into this relationship, figure out from each side what was the appeal to each of the other person, and use it kind of as a window onto the United States in that time. And that's what I tried to do in writing the book, and you'll have to judge whether I succeeded, but I sure enjoyed doing it. Uh, here's a three-part question. Uh, what happened to Rose's family? Did either of their second marriages produce any children? 
And did Rose become an atheist when she became a communist or remain a faithful practitioner of Judaism? Um, and in other words, other words, it's related. Did she convert to marry? Okay. Uh, uh, neither uh, Rose and Graham's marriage nor the subsequent marriages of, of the two of them produced any children. So neither of them have any children. Um, Rose's um, half siblings, uh, because the, the six uh, younger siblings I men mentioned were all the children of her mother and the second husband, not Rose's father. Um, they survived and went different directions and their descendants, uh, so far as I know, are all still in the United States today. I have not had contact with any of them, um, but I know there, there must be a lot of them out there. There are equally large number of Graham's collateral descendants out there because he had uh, eight brothers and sisters, uh, most of whom produced children, grandchildren, and so forth. And uh, actually, a couple of those grandchildren came to a talk I gave about the book in the pre-COVID days when you could still go and give a talk in a, in a bookstore. Um, as for the conversion question, uh, Rose was not particularly devout uh, as uh, in the Jewish faith. It was more she be the paper that she wrote for was in fact sort of the voice of Orthodox Judaism as opposed to Reform Judaism in this country. But she herself was not particularly devout and there's no record of her ever going to a synagogue except later on when she became a famous speaker to give a speech. Um, Graham was raised as an Episcopalian uh, but I don't think either of them converted to anything uh, to get married. They were married uh, by an Episcopalian minister with Graham's brother, who was also an Episcopalian minister assisting as part of the ceremony. But they went to neither church nor synagogue during their marriage, so far as I know. Let's see, we got a, a new batch of uh, questions. <laughs> up too. So I think we can take a few more. And then we're going to be running out of time. Um, let's see. When, did Rose die from lung cancer from her cigar rolling factory day factory work? Well, you, you know the 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 trouble with cancer is that it's often very very hard to pinpoint exactly what started it. Uh, and we don't know. Uh, it, it manifested itself as breast cancer, but she did have lung troubles all her life from, uh, uh, you know, as a result of this work in cigar factories. And remember, everybody who was alive at that time was also breathing a lot of coal smoke, uh, just from living mm -hmm. in, in a, an urban area and traveling on trains and so on. So there were a lot of carcinogens uh, in the air but we can't pin down exactly where her cancer came from. Is she remembered anywhere in the city? Is there a foundation, a plaque, a statue, anything? Not that I know of, but that's for all of you who are active in these historic preservation organizations to make sure it does happen. You could put yeah. up plaques at the places where she lived and worked and so on. Events like the Triangle Fire certainly are remembered, uh, both by mm -hmm. ceremonies and so forth. but. I would certainly uh, advocate putting up a few plaques in Rose's honor. <laughs> so here's some related questions. I'll throw them all out here. Um, can you talk a little bit more about her relationship with Emma Goldman? Um, did Rose know Dorothy Day? Uh, did she have a relationship with other women writers such as uh, an activist such as Crystal Eastman? And uh, I think, I think that, uh, those are the related questions, yeah. Okay, uh, she knew Emma Goldman pretty well and admired her and actually spoke once or twice at benefits for Goldman's uh, magazine. Uh, but then they had a parting of the ways over, and, and actually I should also say uh, she, um, uh, the scene with which I begin the book is a rally at Carnegie Hall which was held to welcome Emma Goldman home from jail after uh, 
Uh, Goldman had spent a couple of weeks in the workhouse in Queens, I believe, for her activities promoting birth control. And Rose uh, uh, outraged uh, <clears throat> the city fathers and the police who were in attendance and so on by distributing from the stage of Carnegie Hall uh, pamphlets uh, describing methods of birth control, which was against the law. She completely upstaged Emma Goldman, who was also <laughs> on the stage, which is a hard thing to do, upstaging Emma Goldman. Uh, and all the newspaper reports that got written the next day were about the pandemonium that was produced when Rose was handing out this illegal material, which of course people were very eager to get. But Emma Goldman didn't mind at all. She was glad to, to see this done. Uh, they then had a falling out uh, after the after Goldman was expelled from this country. You know, she was uh, exiled in 1919 and expelled to Russia, for which she Goldman had great hopes at that time. But uh, she was profoundly disillusioned. She and Alexander Berkman lived there for nearly two years. Uh, they saw the Russian Revolution devouring their anarchist comrades. They saw uh, it imposing a new form of, of totalitarianism. They were bitterly disillusioned and <clears throat> left. And Emma Goldman actually wrote a book called My, My Disillusionment with Russia. And uh, this caused a great rift between her and Rose because Rose uh, unfortunately was an ardent communist at that point and actually declared that uh, Goldman should be burned in effigy. Uh, so they never patched it up over that. Goldman, of course, was not allowed to return to the United States for many years, so they never saw each other again. Um, let's see, there was also a question about Dorothy Day and <clears throat> Crystal Eastman. I believe that she knew Dorothy Day, not a close friend, but if I'm remembering correctly, there's some correspondence with Dorothy Day in her letter files. I'm sure she knew Crystal Eastman, again, there is no correspondence that I recall, but <clears throat> she was definitely close to Max Eastman, Crystal's brother. Uh, and uh, they were together on many occasions, including in that, that, that picture that, 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 that you saw. Okay. okay. Um, can you say a little bit more about uh, Rose's involvement in the uh, historic uh, garment worker strike? Um, <clears throat> she um, would give speeches on behalf of the strikers. Um, this was in 1909, over the winter of 1909, 1910, if I'm remembering mm -hmm. correctly. Uh, <clears throat> and it was important for the strikers to see somebody who was a celebrity for other reasons sort of come to, uh, to, their, to their side. It's the same reason why people working for every kind of conceivable good cause today are always happy to have you know, a well-known movie actor or somebody come mm -hmm. and endorse your organization and speak at your rally and so forth. And <clears throat> Rose was kind of considered such a person because you know, her marriage, as, as uh, I showed you, had literally put her on the front pages. But uh, she was more than just a celebrity because, of course, she had lived the life of a factory worker herself and could speak about that <clears throat> very, very eloquently uh, and did so. And <clears throat> one of the things you realize when you look at her speeches is that she knew how to talk to every kind of audience when she spoke to factory workers themselves, if they were on strike to rally their spirits, which she did in the garment strike and the waiters strike and other occasions, she would refer to her own days in the cigar factory because she knew what it was like. She knew what they were going through. When she spoke to middle-class audiences, she had a way of painting the picture of what life was like inside a factory that these folks might not be familiar with. When she spoke to religious audiences, which she did sometimes, she would speak in terms of parables from the Bible, making the analogies between that and, and uh, dealing with injustice today. So she was always much in demand as a speaker whenever there was a strike or um, 
or something like it. I see someone is asking in the chat, are there any recordings of her speeches? I wish it was just a little too early for that. I could not okay. find any audio or video, but I did find a couple of occasions where people transcribed speeches that she gave. Uh, although normally she did not speak uh, from a text or even from notes. In fact, she spoke about uh, how she needed to read her audience and see what they were responding to and watch their faces in order to know what uh, exactly to say. So we have time for one last question. Uh, what have you gathered did she love about Graham? <laughs> Good question. <clears throat> it's always so fascinating to try to, to, to guess what are the ingredients of a marriage or a relationship. <clears throat> I think when she met him, she saw somebody who came from a class that was very different from hers, but who seemed to be genuinely concerned about the plight of working class people. She admired that. And I think she was also very struck by the fact that he knew an extraordinary range of uh, intellectuals, writers, artists, uh, many of whom were dinner guests at the university settlement. Uh, you saw the photograph of that five-story building. The top two floors were where the volunteers like Graham lived. And they had a big kitchen and dining room there. Uh, and they invited the most extraordinary range of people for dinner who wanted to come see the work at the settlement and meet these bright young volunteers who were working there. So, you know, everybody from, you know, uh, visiting members of parliament from England, Keir Hardy, who was the leading figure in what became the Labour Party, uh, Upton Sinclair, Emma Goldman, and so forth. All of these folks were dinner guests there. So I think Rose was wowed by that. And when Graham looked at Rose, I think he somehow saw somebody who had more humanity and uh, uh, than all of the very, very eligible young women he had been exposed to in his life up to that point. Uh, but he left very little record of his feelings. She was the one who wrote much more about her feelings in her memoir and in her letters to friends and, and so forth. So with him, it's a little more guesswork. Oh, great. Thank you again so much, Adam. Thank you. Absolutely. People may want to uh, buy this book, which is a, a wonderful uh, book. I think we have some uh, some information on that that we yeah, can share. Yeah. Uh, highly recommended and available yeah. through independent bookstores. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a link. So for those of you who are interested and uh, for those of you who missed uh, some or all of tonight's presentation, it will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, along with our other past uh, webinars. And you can access our YouTube channel through our, uh, the homepage of our website, which is uh, www.lesby-nyc.org, which you can see uh, here, uh, the top red uh, address on the screen. So uh, we recommend you keep an eye out for future Lesby webinars, including lectures, and book talks, and hopefully sometime in the not distant future, uh, live walking tours and other events. We're hoping to get back into that maybe this summer. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter uh, to keep up to date with what's going on with Lesby and what's going on with preservation in the Lower East Side in general. And finally, uh, please consider making a donation to Lesby or uh, one of our co-sponsors. You can see the uh, websites here, which you can make a donation uh, to. Uh, we need donations to help us continue to produce webinars such as this one, and to continue our advocacy work for Lower East Side landmarking and preservation in general. You can find a donate button on your original invitation to this event, and again, uh, on the website shown here. So thank you everybody for attending tonight and uh, have a very good night. Thanks again. Thank you.